Okay. It's 11 o'clock Eastern time. So welcome everyone arriving to our medicine 2023. I'm Peter Higgins. I'm the chair of the organizing committee for this year. I My day job is at the University of Michigan where I'm a gastroenterologist and very interested in reproducible medical research. So to start, I just want to mention our code of content conduct. Uh, it's important just to simply be kind, be respectful, and share what you know with others and with the community. Uh, you can use this QR code to view the entire code of conduct. I want to thank our sponsors, Jumping Rivers and Posit, and thank our recruiting partners who at our job fair last night got to talk to many, many folks uh, finishing their PhDs, preparing for jobs, or preparing to switch jobs, looking for employment in medical data science. Uh, many doing it remotely from across the world. I wanna thank our attendees. We actually set a new record this year with 707 registrations and folks from 61 unique countries. We had spectacular workshops on Monday and Tuesday, um, more workshops than we've ever had before, and a wide range from using REDCap, data viz, data cleaning, and a lot of really useful skills that hopefully people learned a lot from. We had demo day on Wednesday. This was a first for us demonstrating specific packages or approaches. And then on Wednesday night, last night, we had our first late night with a poster session, job fair, and for the first time, a live data analytics coding on Twitch with Tan Ho, who um, saw a data set he had never seen before and was able to create really nice interactive tables in under an hour. Uh, very brave of him to code live in front of an audience. Today, we're going to lead off with Neil Batra from Applied Epi doing our keynote. We'll have three dashboard theme talks and then another Twitch session. And if you don't know how to get there, the if you go to the schedule and click on the button adjacent to this talk, it'll take you to the Twitch stream where Eric Nance will be live coding a shiny app from observational data. Uh, then we'll have a break, uh, a few data viz and reporting theme talks, then another break and finish up today with data quality and streamlining your workflow theme talks that'll take us to 515 Eastern. Tomorrow, look forward to a keynote from Jeff Leake from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, a session on shiny modeling and sample size, short break, and then a panel also in Zoom on AI EMR and the ethics of using AI in that situation. Three talks on gene expression and mass spectrometry data, another break, and then a panel on the benefits of having your own local R packages. And then five talks to finish up on applied R in medicine from dengue to heart murmurs, a really wide range of what people are doing in their medical settings. And that'll take us to 530. Uh, I also want to mention um, we have an incentive this year for filling out the meeting evaluations form. Uh, we have a set of hex stickers from many of the presentations and workshops that have been used this week. And you will receive all of these hex stickers by mail if you're one of the first 300 people to fill out an online RMED 23 evaluation. So to incentivize folks, we hopefully will get a lot of evaluations and feedback this year. Uh, people ask about recordings. These will be posted on Friday, June 23rd on the R Consortium YouTube channel. So you can find it by searching within YouTube for the R Consortium, clicking on playlists. And currently you can find R Medicine 2022. There will be a separate playlist from R Medicine 2023. From last time, we have 38 videos and these get a lot more play beyond the folks at the meeting, several with over 2000 views since the meeting itself. I want to thank our sponsors and our organizing committee uh, who met weekly to put this all together, and especially Steve Schrager from the program committee. They did the abstract review and selection and helped organize this into a coherent whole. Our talks will be on Zoom, and the speaker, if the talk was recorded and or a co-author, will often be live in the chat. So we encourage you to ask questions and engage the speaker in a live discussion, share links, share related ideas, and discuss the topic 
interaction is really the key. And I want to now pass this over to our moderator for our first session, Ray Belise, who will be introducing Neil. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome from sunny Miami, Florida. Uh, I'm Ray Belise. I'm a biostatistician here at UM. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Neil Batra. If you look at his CV, it is a collection of the most impressive letters of the alphabet, um, including CDC, USAID, WHO. His work has basically, in my mind, been all about grassroots epidemiology, and it's given rise to the Applied Epidemiology Project, which gives applied epidemiology and public health tools. Um, I, I see it as in the form of an online book with 50 of the most beautiful modules I've ever seen produced on topics like data management, data summary, uh, numeric and graphics summaries, as well as data dissemination. So without further ado, um, uh, Neil, take it away. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, let me just share my screen and we can get started. I wanna thank Dr. Higgins, Carolyn and all of the others on the organizing committee for inviting me today. It's it's an honor to be here and I'm very happy with to be sharing really storytelling today with you because I think the story I wish to share today is about a group of epidemiologists who recognized a need in their community and sought to meet it, to make it easier for their colleagues around the world to adopt and benefit from R. And so as I share some of the lessons that we've learned, some of the approaches that we've taken uh, to help people in our own, uh, really our own, our own colleagues, um, I hope that you can take some of as you think about how to make R more accessible in your own domains. So just confirming, can someone in the crowd that um, the, the screen is visible? Looks good. Thank you. So the story begins with a bit of a premise and really this was a premise, but it's also sort of a visceral experience that myself and my, my colleagues experienced, which is that most epidemiologists around the world are using either substandard or way too expensive analytical tools. Um, and, and by and large, they want free open source tools like R that allow for versatile data wrangling and analysis but there's a lack of relevant training and support. And so that's what sort of underpins all of this. And I say this was an experience because many of us, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, who knew R would receive emails and requests on a daily basis for assistance in trying to learn R. So that in a way that was, was relevant to sort of frontline practice. And that leads me to my next uh, slide, which I recognize is a bit crude. So I hope you'll forgive me for that it, or, or sort of simple, it's simple, but in, a, in epi, there's a difference in, and there was a difference in how R was being used, right? So in academic epidemiology, um, R is widely accepted now. There are many resources available, um, but in this applied epidemiology or what's sometimes called field epidemiology, although we're trying to move away from that term, where the, there's always a time pressure, the objective is really operational insight for the disease control at the sort of ground level. And it's really simple descriptive data that is, consists of most of the work. Um, and in this space, our adoption is lower than it could be uh, and reproducible workflows are just less common. Um, and so I think uh, even if um, there were our resources available in public health, you would find that they were focused on the kinds of tasks that are more common in academic epidemiology, as opposed to those that are the day-to-day -day work of those who work the, at the ground level in public health. So I guess I wanted to share a short video of my colleague, uh, Dr. Chukuma here, um, because he expressed sort of this sentiment of, of trying to learn our most times in the past, I try, when I care about how I want to go online and look at the program and learn the program, I see that the examples they are using are from the economic uh, market uh, forces, from predictions, from gambling and uh, other things. But no one has, because they are not epidemiologists, they don't understand the nature, the variables we work with, they don't understand the way we think and the type of output we want to produce out there. So having an epidemiologist that have experience in the field that have passed through those challenges 
sit down and use this, those same codes to write simplified scripts or programs that can do the work we need to do as epidemiologists. Make, le makes learning out using uh, applied AP method simple. And so I think what he at the end there was saying is, uh, you know, having someone who's relatable, who understands your day to day challenges, whether it's really messy data sets or uh, the, the, the data collection that is so much of epidemiology, understanding where the data are coming from and the biases that are inherent in them. Um, here's the here's a here's a story. I was working in Haiti in 2021 with a colleague, um, a senior epidemiologist there who had used our epidemiologist, our handbook to transition his daily routine of, of, of day, day, disease surveillance to R. And the impact here is really undeniable, right? Going from point and click manual workflows that took the, I would say 80% of his week and switching that to being under an hour. You think of the, the power that that has for the workforce and really for the brain space of people working um, in these kinds of jobs. So here, again, just a brief quote on, on that. We have a prolonged outbreak and the, the data collection process is not under your control and you have to do the cleaning over and over again every time you have to use the data set to update your reports and other things. It takes away a, a, a large amount of time that can be invested into thinking into the uh, other aspect of the uh, investigation, the investigation. So I think it's what, what I hear from there is it gives us space to be epidemiologists and not be working in Excel all the time, cleaning cells manually and things like this. These scripted reproducible workflows are very freeing in that way. And I know I'm speaking to people who, who believe similarly that the power of R. But in public health, we wanted to run a survey and assess a little bit more structured way the, 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 the demand for R. And so what we found was that um, almost all epis were feeling constrained by their point and click analytical tools. Um, that most said that R training should be a high priority and that very few said that their agency had sufficient capacity to train their epidemiologists in R. Um, and so to us, this signaled a lack, uh, that there's a gap here that needed to be addressed. And I think it's important to step back and just mention that in uh, R is not just a new tool coming in, but it's also a new culture, right? The idea of open source, um, it, it, it is, um, it's a paradigm shifting switch, right? Not only for the end users uh, who actually become creators along the way, um, but also for the sort of more systemic shifts about employability and representation and really local problem solving. And I, I know that you all um, can appreciate that. So where do we come in? Applied Epi um, is really a grassroots movement. And I say that because it, it arose organically um, from the ground. We're not affiliated with any major institution or a university, but we are now a registered nonprofit organization. And we are seasoned, experienced public health practitioners, epidemiologists who have um, sort of passed through those challenges, as Chukuma was saying, of the messy public health practice. And this has resulted in us having very strong relationships and partnerships locally with national health ministries um, and internationally with organizations like the World Health Organization, uh, Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, and also TEFINET, which is um, one of the worldwide associations of, of field epidemiology training programs, which are present in most of the world. So we focus on um, frontline epi and public health. Um, so training that is relevant to local practice, uh, tools, making them more accessible, accessible for agile analytics, support, meaning sustained support. And I'll get to how we do that in, in, in later. And ultimately when we advance um, the, these tools, it actually improves the, the methods of, 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 of analysis and, and the standards for sort of methodological practice, we think. So here's what we've devised in our, uh, for our, our sort of ecosystem to support um, public health um, use of R. And when I talk about public health, it's a lot of clinicians, a lot of pharmacists, a lot of disease investigators, uh, and also researchers. 
the story really begins with the epidemiologist R handbook, and this actually predates the existence of our of our organization. Um, it's a book down uh, for those of you who know the package. Um, it's so our markdown. It's free. It's open source, and we launched it. Uh, after about nine months of work back in 2021, um, about 120 contributors um, contributed to it in their spare time. Um, and it has about 50 chapters and it has been very widely received uh, and, and used in, the, in, the, in, in our, at least in our space. Um, so I just wanna to touch a little bit on the FBR handbook. Um, as I mentioned, the day-to-day -day, uh, tasks are really it's a task-oriented book. So of course it begins with the basics of R, of which there are many resources to learn, but we wanted to have this, the philosophy of this book was if this is all you have and you're working offline in a setting, um, this will be enough to get by. Um, and so talking about R projects and importing data leads into the core topics of Epi's day-to-day -day work, which is cleaning the data, um, which there's many familiar topics here. I wanna highlight for a moment deduplication, which is a really common task among applied epidemiologists. And so we've shared some techniques and uh, that, that we've found useful for deduplication. Um, GIS is very common. And then we get into sort of the more epidemiological uh, topics like modeling, time series, outbreak detection, and the, the more statistical uh, chapters. Um, but data visualization is also really um, a common task. And so we, we dwell on age pyramids and making tables, how to make transmission chains, these kinds of things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that's been around for almost two years now, and it really needs some updating, but I'll talk about that soon. Um, and of course, the, the bread and butter of an epi's life is producing reports. Um, and so talking about our markdown and making that more, more easy and different kinds of dashboards. I wanted to just share this last fun video um, about the, the power of R to make workflows more simple. So it's about the data visualization. I think that is the main thing for me because we do a lot of analysis for me. If I want to generate any map, of where I need to... Let me just pause it so that it buffers. Go to QGIS, you can do that and come back here and so on. So for me, I, I think that path of data visualization is the main main thing for me. Once you get your code right with the ggplot, that's cool. Amazing. So how ggplot and making maps really reduces the amount of tools that an FB has to rely on. Um, Many, almost a hundred people reached out to help translate the FER handbook into many different languages. And so we're very happy to have these different uh, languages up and available with more coming soon. Um, one story I want to share finally about the handbook is recently we were excited to learn that um, the Ugandan Ministry of Health in their Ebola response was relying quite heavily on the FER handbook to do their analytics uh, for the recent Ebola response. Um, and so this actually led to quite a, a strong partnership. As you can see in the timeline there, we ultimately supported uh, their team with our training and also with, an, with our, our help desk. But I think this quote from Daniel goes to say, you know, it's so nice that our, our is often scattered all across the internet um, and having it in one place was very helpful for their team. Um, some of the challenges we've encountered um, and, and some of the successes, I think the fact that we were an independent entity making this made it a lot more agile and allowed us to produce it very quickly. Um, there were a lot of editorial choices we had to make and still have to make as we consider revisions. Um, how much, how little to, to show, how many solutions. You all know you can do everything a dozen ways in R. Um, and now actually maintenance and version control is becoming quite a challenge uh, considering that we have so many translations and we're looking to transition to using Quarto. Um, and I think that if any of you are thinking about book downs um, or, or similar sort of text that you're gonna produce, these are some of the challenges to be aware of. Um, then it was very quickly apparent that the handbook was never meant to be a learn R tool. It's a code um, sample book. Right, it's a reference book. And so there are many people who could benefit from a synchronous course. Um, and so what we designed was a 40 hour intro course that was really catered towards public health use cases. The philosophy we followed was that we are frontline practitioners. And so we're bringing that uh, sort of experience into the instruction itself. 
we really wanted people to equip people to use R on their local computer. So this affects how much time we put into the preparation of troubleshooting installations and the decision to not use a cloud environment. We wanted it to be synchronous because so much of the troubleshooting we, we feel needs to be one-on-one -on -one if we're dealing and trying to educate people for whom this is quite a scary proposition, learning how to code. We are very intentional with our vocabulary, things as simple as not using the word string, right? When that is, someone might associate that with their shoelace when using a word or characters, um, at least at the beginning to introduce the topic more, more in a more friendly way. Building that confidence to tinker and then finishing with support after the class ends. And that's where our R help desk comes in. And so I think that some of the curriculum choices are of interest to this crowd, perhaps. How early do you introduce our markdown? Some people have done this right at the beginning. We elected to teach in our scripts first and then introduce that kind of uh, workflow towards the end of the class. How much base R versus tidyverse, et cetera. Um, of course, we're using our projects. Um, how do you teach people to install packages in a simple way? And so there's many uh, sort of choices here that I can elaborate on in the questions and answers at the end if, if people desire. But just to say, um, we are losing, using LearnR and Grade This, and they're, they're wonderful tools that we're very grateful for. Uh, we've been running this almost nonstop for the last year and a half. Um, and so over 700 people um, have benefited from this course at, I think it's 150 agencies now around the world. And again, many local practitioners um, in the US, outside the US, in, in pretty much every single continent. Um, and you can just see here, this is one week of our training schedule, which is essentially around the clock. And the nice thing is that we have instructors all around the world. And so we can actually benefit from that by having, taking advantage of the evenings in one time zone being the work days in the next time zone. And I wanna take a moment to thank all of our instructors who do this and who are often teaching late at night or early in the morning because they really believe in this, in this objective of, of, of allowing it easy, making it easier to, to learn R uh, among their colleagues around the world. Um, so thank you to them and all those who support them. Uh, this slide, I wanted to just highlight this decision we made, which was to uh, uh, do preparation calls with every participant before they start the course to help troubleshoot their computer setup. And this has been painstaking, but absolutely critical um, to resolving VPN issues, OneDrive, um, syncing the package installation, having old versions. It's, it's a bit of a nightmare, but it's worth it if you want to start the class um, smoothly and, and, and help them understand how to do that in the future when they went, will undoubtedly encounter these kinds of issues again. Um, and what this has led to are some really fun experiences. Um, so this is one example where we ran a training for um, Ministry of Health and the National Institute of Statistics in Cambodia. And it was kind of a hybrid setup where they were gathered in person and we had our instructors around the world joining. And this was with simultaneous translation into Khmer. Um, and so that was uh, one challenge we had to overcome. But um, another class recently was with consecutive translation, which again, sort of impacts the curriculum and the pace of the class. And this was into Ukrainian. Uh, where we have several cohorts of local epidemiologists across Ukraine. Um, another class uh, in Central Asia, where we did consecutive translation again. Um, and beyond the translation, we also have instructors who can teach in French and in Spanish, and we're building out our Portuguese team. And so we can have the materials in those languages as well. And I think that that's really important to being able to reach a wide audience with, with this. Um, we've seen improvement um, among the among the participants in the course, although we hope to do more sort of um, structured evaluation of the impact in the years to come, it's just been such a rapid um, mobilization of our whole team that uh, sort of we want to do more objective assessment of the R code that is coming out of the class. Um, and I think moving on to the next pieces here, for those who can't access our courses, we wanted to have a free option. So we built learn our tutorials that are available online that are very similar to our core our, our synchronous courses and these were built with doctors without borders and tefnet um, 
We have a few R packages, but it's not really our focus. Um, these packages are built uh, to provide helper functions uh, for common FE tasks and, and sort of work around gaps in other packages. And, and also to provide templates of situation reports, which are commonly produced by epidemiologists. Um, one example, right, age pyramids, trying to produce this uh, from scratch in ggplot can, can be a little dangerous uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you make a mistake. Um, just one example. Um, getting to the more advanced offerings, we want to, I'd say 95% of the courses we run now are intro courses, but we want to build out the, the space for people to grow into advanced courses. These are some of the courses we have or are developing. Um, I think there's a lot of attention on dashboards, but what we usually try and emphasize to prospective people uh, wanting to learn dashboards is, do you, do you really need to learn Shiny for this, for your purpose? Um, and if so, we can try and get you there, but there are many other ways to communicate your information that don't involve the, the, the coding involved in learning Shiny. Um, practice, I think is very important. We hear from our participants, where can I go to get more practice? And so what we've in, engaged in is a, is a worldwide effort to uh, partner with field epidemiology training programs who have a robust curriculum that often involves case studies using EpiInfo or SPSS or Excel and help them transition those to R and then offer them publicly to try and break down those, those walls that are keeping those case studies from being used by anybody. And so we have a case study repository, it's growing, um, but the idea here is that that, that is, built, um, is built out more. And then the last piece I want to talk about in this pyramid is arguably the most important, and that is mobilizing this public health community to provide sustained support. And there's two pieces here, the community forum and a help desk. Um, and so I'll start with the forum because there are many forums out there, um, but what we, the idea here was uh, one that is embracing the public health context that is underlying so many of these questions. And that's really friendly to beginners. So many of the people we engage with are terrified of posting anything on Stack Exchange, um, myself included. Um, but the idea that this is a place where you can make mistakes, where people will, will help you in a friendly way arrive at how to make a reproducible example uh, and sort of know the background context of, of your public health work and help you arrive at the best conclusion. Um, and so you can see a few of the kinds of questions we get in this forum about transmission chains, about simple recoding of values and deduplicating again, uh, a very common topic, et cetera. Um, and I think this is going to be accompanied by a concerted effort to help people make that first post and learn about reprexes because it will just help everyone, the answerers and the questioners. So incorporating this into our courses, uh, holding webinars and support sessions and helping people craft that first reprex. It kind of breaks the ice and allows them to, to feel comfortable posting. And what that grows into is an R help desk. And so this is, we really wanted to be able to offer these one-on-one -on -one calls out, um, out to the public. Um, and so we have this help desk, we have technicians who are staffing it in different languages. Um, and, and, and at this point, we're mostly offering it to agencies, but we do hope to open it generally to the public soon. Here's one example where we worked with, again, the Ugandan Ministry of Health over several months to help them uh, analyze their, their outbreak data, produce communications and reports, and really answer the, the task force that was driving the response. And so here you have uh, you know, the quote from our technician and from, from Daniel, who is largely leading the data side of this response. Uh, another example we uh, was uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Adewuyi in the Gambia. They recently had an outbreak uh, of kidney injuries, and he reached out and said, can, can I get some assistance with this? So we were able to support him in just a matter of hours on that, on that response. And we've also worked with Doctors Without Borders on some of their surveys and um, and, uh, and other just sort of urgent tasks, right? And so where does this go? We have dozens of technicians who are available 24 seven, but we don't yet have the capacity to offer calls within instantaneously. And so we want to, if the demand grows to be able to offer that, we want to have rapid determination scholarships 
um, and be able to offer more specialized skills. Um, and so I think this, I hope that you are excited about this as well and that you can see it, see it growing. Beyond R, our organization also addresses uh, methods. And so this is the second book that we're looking to produce, which is the Applied Epidemiology Manual. And this was a request received by a lot of our partners. And we now have about 80 authors and reviewers working on this book as sort of a one-stop shop, uh, more on the method side. So it's going to be tool agnostic, but we'll link very closely to the R handbook um, and those case studies that I mentioned. And I think I want to close with some some remarks here uh, and maybe questions for you um, and we can we can talk but i the first one is how do we ensure that our development growth is also led by the 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 practitioners and not only early adopters who are more perhaps tech savvy um, uh, you know i think that that voice needs to be part of it and one way that manifests is linking the developers with the end users and making the feedback channels between those those groups more fluid. Um, so for example, we partner with a number of um, programs and projects and universities that are building packages for epidemiology. And, uh, and we're trying to have those ground level users, maybe it's your forecasting uh, where an epidemic is going and you have a, an epidemiologist at a local health department and they are trying to implement that R code package and they are not sure about the methods, they don't want to make a mistake um, and they have uh, concerns to pass back to the developer on how to make the package more user-friendly or how to actually address the needs that they are experiencing in their jurisdiction. Um, so I think having that flow be more fluid and I hope that spaces like the community forum will be a place for that. And I would ask you all, in what other fields, um, whether they're subfields within medicine or adjacent fields like public health, will our adoption and the acceleration of our adoption result in tremendous real world impact? Um, and, you know, thinking about the amount of hours and brain space that can be saved and freed up uh, by moving those repetitive manual inefficient and error prone workflows into reproducible scripted workflows. Um, what are the other areas like that that could perhaps benefit from the, the work that we're doing and that many others are doing near us? Um, I think I touched upon this, but how do we create channels between developers and, and front end users? And I think that many groups are doing this and they're, and they're starting to do it well, but there's, especially within uh, epidemiology, there's room to, to grow. And this gets to also, how do we create beginner friendly question and answer spaces? How do we bring down the walls for someone to make a post in Stack Exchange or in a, or in a similar space? And then I think a, a more uh, perhaps provocative question is in, in, a, in a field where there are many tools and there will be many tools in the years to come, what is ours role there? Um, you know, we have people for whom Excel is not going away. It is a workhorse in the space that that I that we work in. Um, tools that are more point and click, like FB Info or SPSS, and then we have other languages coming in, uh, whether it's Julia or use cases for Python or something like this. So, what is R's role there as a as a language that I think has a very robust community behind it? Um, it has the public health and epi and medicine uh, community of developers of support is very strong and that's why when people come to us and they say oh but what about python we say well like let's look at r and let's look at the community and the resources and all of the innovation and and, and rapid fire um, responsiveness of that community to the needs of public health um, and and i so that's i think a role so I guess I'll close with with those um, thoughts. Um, there's some of our contact information, and I, I guess my hope is that uh, you know you all work in spaces in medicine, um, in agencies and institutions and universities, and there may be other spheres like we've done for ground pub, 
ground level public health, where you can hopefully learn from some of the, the challenges we've faced uh, in trying to increase our adoption. And I hope that you keep in touch as we continue to, to, to do this together. So I'll pass it back over to Ray, and maybe we can take some questions. Very good. So I've, I've been taking notes and watching the chat as, as you've been talking. Um, lots of interesting um, comments and dynamic things going on. I, the one comment really struck me was that a lot of the fear with learning R comes from people who start out the wrong way. So do you have any, any thoughts on that? On, um, you know, you talked about the tools that are made available for setting up and making sure that people can get started, but just in general, um, how do you prevent that? How do you prevent the initial failures? Yeah, I think this is a critical question. Um, and I think having a, a friendly, relatable face and voice at your side is so important. And that's why we've invested so much of our resources in one-on-one -on -one interactions, especially for people for whom have never even conceived of themselves as growing into being a coder before. Um, and being on hand when they hit those mistakes, those error messages, and otherwise they would divert back to their, their, their well-practiced routine with Excel. So that during their first project, they have someone that they can call and within a few minutes, they are online with, um, with someone who knows public health and who knows R and who knows how to speak in a, in a beginner friendly manner using vocabulary that is not, um, that's not intimidating. Um, those are the critical components. And it's, it's taken a lot of legwork for us to, to get the staffing and that's why we leverage this part-time staffing model. It's people working after their day job, um, but we can distribute that load across the 100 plus people that we have on our team. And they're only contributing a few hours a month, but that has allowed us to, um, to tie all of those people together and offer a service like that. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's pretty critical. Very good. It's interesting to hear your, your thought. Um, another comment um so wesley wilson dumped a big pile of resources for for starters uh, in particular that the one that i know the most about is data carpentry how do you see your work fitting together with them i don't think i saw them called out in your slides so uh, what are your plans for leveraging the other um, great teaching resources out there yeah, data carpentries and many others. The FBR handbook is full of links out to those kinds of resources. And that's where we started was um, it's it, it was we wanted to provide public health and epi um, task oriented code snippets and then where best link out to the existing resources that teach them that show show them better. Um, and so the, yeah, the FBR handbook is full of links to carpentries and others yeah. cool um many people singing your praises in the chat um there's a few comments near and dear to my heart about tying in uh red cap uh in the future uh, there's comments about other useful communities that are are, are more welcoming and, and stressing the importance of what you're doing um, so community.rstudio.com um, someone commented that uh, Luke Morris commented it, it's it's less knee jerky uh, than Stack Exchange. Um, let's see what else. Um, I don't know. So uh, other folks want to throw in questions into the chat. I'd love to pass them along. And Peter, you've been throwing in suggestions as we go along. Is there anything you want to circle back to? Sorry, I had to unmute. I wanted to ask Neil what he thought of, you know, Mina Setinkaya Rundell, who's uh, basically posted a thesis of let them eat cake to get beginners to get from data to a visible and usually visualization output quickly so they build their confidence. And I don't know if you've seen that blog post, but she's a big fan of trying to get people some early wins, early successes. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's that's a very important methodological or pedagogical tool. Um, and I think that our course does that to some extent. We've incorporated it to some extent. We 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 use a very relatable example in our first session about um, you know how this is teaching basic R syntax and what what can you get out of writing a code instead of doing Excel or something? And it's about calculating the amount of COVID-19 tests you might need to order this month based on a few different sites and the expected amount and, and turning that into a reproducible workflow. And so it's not a visualization um, because uh, I think it just gets a little tough if it, the, the balance of are you going to start teaching how to make the visualization versus um, uh, versus just giving them a code and saying run it. I think mm -hmm. everyone comes into R having seen the visualizations, but once they start to say, oh, I can write code and produce something that would have taken me otherwise half an hour or an hour, then you see the light bulb go off. And so I think that's maybe, I haven't read that article, but the essence of it is having the light bulb go off. And every one of our instructors can describe when that happens in a course, you know, and it may be the first module, it may be when they see the R markdown happen and they say, oh my goodness, I will save so much time with this. Or it may be the visualization that they see, um, or it may be the data cleaning. And that's why we start with data cleaning is because so much of our, uh, the participants that we enroll, they spend most of their time doing that. So when they see that, oh, I can press a button and have my code run and have my data clean in a matter of seconds, that's a light bulb moment for them. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Mina's post is essentially having run into instructors who say, well, you have to you have to earn that visualization by doing your data cleaning first and doing, you know, walk both ways in the snow. Um, and she said, no, 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 let them eat cake first get them excited and then then they'll stick around they'll they'll keep going uh is and that I'm massively summarizing a long post there but um another uh thought on if you want to integrate Julia I don't know if you know Karen Deep Singh he was one of our former keynotes he's essentially creating uh the tidyverse in Julia um, and it is an ongoing project, but people are pretty excited about it. So that may turn out to be an, an entry point for folks. Wonderful. That's great. I think at Clyde Epi at the end of the day, uh, we want our, our sort of resources to be available in all kinds of, of tools, right? So we have an Epi R handbook, but we're starting an Epi Julia handbook, right? We're going to have similar resources for Excel um, because so many people are still going to use Excel. Um, and trying not to duplicate what already exists, but I think working with colleagues like that to to have uh, to have Epi and, and ground level public health oriented Julia resources is a is a great way. Super yeah. cool. As uh, um, many people in the chat asking, how can I help? So, mm -hmm. how how do we sign up to uh, to help you with your mission? Yeah, I would say. Um, there's a link on the screen, if it's still sharing, where you can apply to join our part-time instructor pool. Um, and that's sort of our gateway. Um, so if you're interested in being in our help desk, um, that's sort of, that's our first, our first line of applications is, is that, is that link right there, applyw.org slash join. Otherwise you can email us if you think you're, you're you want to offer your skills in a, in a different way. Um, and we'd be happy to, to chat with you. Um, there is one thing I wanted to share. There's a question here, Jacqueline Janice. Uh, what platform are we using for our courses? Um, we don't use Posit Cloud. Um, and so learners are using their local desktop versions of our studio. But I think what we've found really powerful is um, actually Google Meets, um, because it's one of the only platforms that I know where you can have multiple people sharing their screen at the same time. And when you flip that around and you ask all the participants to share their screens, what you end up with is a way that instructors can watch the students as they are live coding, working on the exercises and instantly see um, who, who's, who's having trouble, who's making an error, and then invite them into a one-on-one -on -one breakout room uh, and have that private conversation with them about how to fix it. So 
uh, that's what we found to be an incredible virtual teaching tool for coding. You just improved, you just improved my course evaluations ever going forward. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, there, uh, there was a couple people or someone asked about chat GPT. And so I want to open it up to a broader, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of BARD, is it Google BARD. Uh, what are you thinking about, about the, the rise of chat GPT in terms of the teaching tool? Um, and also for the all parts of, of your mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, am, I was expecting this question, but I, I, I'll start by saying that I haven't had enough time to think about it because our, our schedule and our, our growth has just been so consuming. We're a very small team and we're working very hard to just kind of do what we're doing. But I think to answer your question, I'm excited. I'm also anxious. Um, I suspect, based on what I know of how technological um, advances are ultimately slowly distributed around the world, I anticipate we will still need to be teaching coding for quite some time. Um, and 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 beyond that, what we're teaching is not just programming. Right, we're teaching a mindset. We're teaching ways to think about tidy data, um, about uh, data collection, um, and 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 how to think in a workflow, in an organized workflow, and in a reproducible way. And no matter what the AI world comes out with, those kinds of skills are really important for epidemiologists to know. Um, um, so, other than that, I'd say we're we're looking at ways to incorporate into the curriculum. But at our core is going to be teaching people how to write the code as if they don't have that kind of support. And if they do, that's all the better. Outstanding. Uh, are there any additional questions floating around in the real world? Or Peter, have you seen things go by that I've missed? Um, I, th I think a lot of agreement on uh, Stack Overflow being scary and harsh um, and looking for alternatives. Can folks who are, are savvy jump in and help out in answering questions on Applied Epi? Absolutely, it's an open forum. Um, the, uh, the account is free, of course, uh, to, to read. It's, anybody can go in and read those questions um, at community.appliedepi.org. And if you want to answer, please do. Um, just make an account and, and post. We're more, more than welcome. There's a section of the website delayed, de dedicated to our code. It's definitely the most active site, uh, part of the site, but there are other parts that are more tool agnostic or more focused on methods, study design, surveillance methodology, um, you know, these kinds of things or uh, math modeling um, or upcoming events and things like that. But the R code section is definitely the most active um, and there's people posting in there almost every day about I'm working in this country and I'm trying to do this study or I'm working in this country and I have this outbreak and I'm trying to make this plot or that plot, this kind of thing. For in a lot of my world is spent uh, working with people who are trained in SAS originally and are now um, moving to R and some are moving to Julia. Do, do, does your platform offer tailored advice for people who are walking in the door with different skill sets? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked that. So in the EPR handbook, one of the first was called Transition to R. And it has um, tailored advice for people who are coming if they have only used Excel in the past and they need to think about transitioning from that kind of mentality into writing code for the first time. And then there's specific parts of that chapter for SAS users and for Stata users. And they include Sort of mini mini dictionaries, if you will, and sort of how R how R differs from the tool they're coming from, and we do see this in our classes. Um, uh, we, some of the classes are open to anybody in the public who wants to to register a seat, and in that case, you have people who have already quite substantial programming backgrounds coming in, and we have uh, advanced materials for them if they happen to move faster in the class, um, and then others who are coming in and never having programmed in their life. And so we take a little bit of a different approach with them, but it just depends on the person. Some people pick it up extremely quickly. Yeah, in, in my teaching experience, there's always one person with a degree in computer science and one person who has mastered both point and click with the mouse. It's, yeah. it's super challenging. 
Um, I'm looking to see what else is fitting here. Peter, do you have any other any other big picture questions to ask? You know, I ran into this in teaching um, the scary error messages and ended up in a book actually creating a whole chapter on what to do when you see an error message. Mm -hmm. It what it is the best approach to get people past that just like oh wow oh ouch yeah error message stop help help um uh, I'll, I'll start with the fbr handbook one of those chapters towards the end is common errors um and so we just this is meant to be a brain dump where we post common errors and how we've solved them and more on the um more, more is so many epidemiologists work on government computers, right? And and there's a lot of just walls and ways that our markdown can fail um, when you're trying to produce things. And so a lot of those error messages are related to that. Um, but even the um, in the course, we we you know we encourage. There's parts of the course where we have people read the documentation and the package and then try to apply it without us coaching them at all. And then we circle back to them and talk about what was difficult to read in the documentation. Um, we can share ones that are that are very uh, difficult to read and ones that are very uh, much easier to read. And we say, if you were designing a, a package, how would you write it? Um, uh, and so I think, uh, but other than that practice and the help desk, I keep coming back to this one-on-one -on -one support, but for people who are on the fence about this whole endeavor, um, and, and, and any um, sudden movement in the wrong direction could prevent them from continuing their R journey. Having someone who's readily available and, and with a friendly demeanor ready to help them solve that error message, explain it, and so that next time they can understand that cryptic red text in their R Studio console, uh, is, it makes a difference. Yeah. And I often find teaching people how to read documentation because it's such a very particular structure it can be valuable and i don't you know in a perfect world i make the documentation a lot more friendly but how do you approach that from a, for a beginner who needs to you know get over that hump of how do i read the documentation well i will say that the priority for us for the early days is not to uh, turn off the person. And so we don't show them the scariest documentation at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, because that's a very, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity for them to say, this is not for me. This doesn't look like something I will ever know how to read. So it only comes at the end that we really get into, into the documentation when they've, uh, they're very comfortable with the terms of arguments and uh, default settings. And they've, they've, realize that you know writing true you don't put the quotation marks around it and all these kinds of things yeah mm -hmm. but i think the priority at the beginning for us is not not scaring people away yeah i i have a, a so one i was in a great my my weird twist on this is i try and teach package development as early as possible so mm -hmm. to teach the idea of um, how do you document a data set in R? You know, how, how do you set it aside, save it, build a documentation for that? You know, set aside how to build functions until people are, are much farther along. But the idea of encapsulating within a package an R markdown document along with the data set, you know, you've got a fully reproducible paper. Have you put any thoughts into that? Like, um, where, where does vignette building, um, do, do you think about the transition from writing an R markdown um, you know, paper to writing a vignette. Is that in your radar? Fascinating. Um, I would say not in our curriculum yet, but I think that is as we seek to move beyond the intro scope that will be in the agenda. Um, we, we, we tease a little bit with writing functions, sort of providing code and showing them you could take this and put it into a, a function. Um, and that gets people excited, but it's sort of an optional part of our early curriculum. Because I think it showing people that they can be creators, right, is is actually a bit of a, it, it's a big shift for people when they realize that, oh, most of our was built by people like me uh, or, or slightly more experienced than me. 
with me. Um, and that it actually warms people to the software, I've found. Yeah. Yep, I agree. I have nothing else on my list. Um, are there more questions out there? Mm, what are the top two challenges facing Applied Epi? Mm. Um, so I think the, the we've grown incredibly fast for a small organization um, in terms of the demand we're facing and the operation, the, the just the, the extent of the operations we're running. Um, having uh, a small team that's mostly part-time has been a challenge. Right. I wish that we had a big uh, funder. We don't really have a big funder or a big grant to sit back and relax. And so the uh, the pace of work has been very, very demanding. And the fact that all most of us are are have other jobs is is distracting. Right. So I think that's one big challenge. Um, and then I think the other issue is it gets to that I slide on the FBR handbook and version control and making robust um controlled materials now our, the extent of our materials is getting very expansive and so making sure that data sets are aligned you know approaches are, are aligning across classes and that the language translation cross version control is a bit of a nightmare for us and so we're trying to reach out for assistance with with that but we've we've tried a few a few approaches but um that's difficult good question thank you Other questions from the audience? So, Neil, I mean, this is kind of spitballing the whole idea, but would it make sense for Applied Epi to get funding from something like the Ford Foundation or the Gates Foundation? I mean, it feels like your goals are largely aligned. I think there's a lot of uh, entities that share our goals. Yeah. And so I think we would be very open to something like that. Yeah. I think we're, I think there's a lot of impact on global health to be had from accelerating this transition and making sure that it's led from the ground level. Uh, because if it's not, it's it, less people will actually make the transition. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that uh, there's a role for us to play there. I'm flipping through the chats. I I am so pleased to have heard you talk. Uh, I, I wish I had prepared more questions. It's mm -hmm. a rare opportunity to get your time. Yeah. Um, and Neil, I'm curious, what's, you know, in folks in Liberia, Nigeria, what are the most common data collection tools they actually practically use? And they're, I assume they're probably on their phones. Well, I think in many countries around the world, uh, there's so many, such a variety of data collection tools. Um, and I think that is one of the main challenges that faces public health is kind of consolidation around some of those tools. Um, and each one has its own strengths and, and weaknesses for different kinds of settings. We see a lot of people using um, using the Kobo toolbox. And so a lot of our educational materials uh, reference that and kind of help people use R around that. Um, you know, a lot of uh, agencies use DHIS2 uh, as part of their data pipeline. Um, and so we do try and craft our materials around those common platforms. REDCap was mentioned, um, you know, and in the US, there's so many different uh, platforms and, 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 you know, uh, sort of data, data storage mechanisms that those are often kind of, we have to do uh, just sort of bespoke uh, solutions for each person. But we, what we come back to is, you know, our sort of default assumption is, you know, you're working on R locally on your computer and more and more people are using cloud-based, but that's not something that we have dive, we, do, we dive into very much. 
you, you answered the question of um, if someone in general comes in and says, how can I help? Um, let me throw it out in the other direction. There's package developers here. Um, what do you need? What do you want us to build? <laughs> um, great question. Let's let's ask a lot of people on the community forum and then let's talk because I've been away from the ground for a year or two now doing mostly teaching. Um, okay. But but I think that actually getting to Peter's question, the the biggest pain point is the data collection coming from the ground and and standardizing it and having it flow into analytical uh, workflows. Um, and so a lot of groups are working on ways to standardize what we call line lists, right? The sort of case, the list of cases and their attributes. Um, and uh, everybody from the humanitarian sector to the epi sector, and, and everyone's trying to figure out what the best way forward with that is, whether there's some kind of tagging Hexel or standard uh, package that assigns uh, certain values. I think that's a space that's very fluid right now, um, but that is a, a very worthwhile place to invest time and thinking in, as long as it's really well grounded in the end user. And I know a couple of years ago, Hadley Wickham was very interested in developing a data collection tool for R. Um, and I think he's still interested. And, you know, could there be a consortium of sorts of Doctors Without Borders and, you know, interested parties uh, to have a free, downloadable, open source data collection tool that would nicely export to R. Mm -hmm. Is is there space for that? Or is that just really hard to get everyone at the same table virtually? Perhaps, but I, I think that I think some good options already exist. We talked about okay. Kobo. Um, and that's used extensively. Um, and so I would, yeah, there's always this balance of, of is there room for improvement or can we improve what's already there? Um, it's a room for a new a new thing, or should we just improve what already exists? So I would be careful about that. Um, that's just coming from my discipline, my space of public health epi sort of emergencies work. Um, other fields, the the breadth that Hadley deals with, I'm sure there there might be other. It is a most common question we get is, does R do data collection too? <laughs> and we usually say, well, there's a lot of ways you can feed data into R. Um, and that's actually one of the, the positive aspects about it is the versatility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're not seeing in chat, the uh, the R, the Red Cap package developers in the house are coughing <laughs> and wiggling in their chairs, uh, me included. Yeah, lots of users use Red Cap as well. We've worked with a number of projects in different continents that are using Red Cap. And I think there's great R documentation there linking Red Cap to R. Uh, yeah. But we're, we're trying. There, there's uh, there are restrictions on you know it's not fully open source, but there, there's a lot of options available, mm -hmm. and a lot of people use RedCap, so it's it's very important that uh, that that kind of support is is readily available. So I'm not seeing any more questions, Peter. You got anything else, or no, we, we can scoot to the next the next topic? Yeah. I, I'm sharing some Kobo resources because it's new to me, but it looks cool. Yeah, yeah I think cool. we're good. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. For thank you time. so much, Neil. An absolute pleasure. And again, thank you for fighting the, the fight that you've been you've been going after. The tools that you provided my students are so grateful. They've been grateful, you know, for years. You 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 provide tools that make my my job easier so thank you glad to hear it